went to the Olympic Training Center. And as I was phasing out of my competitive career, I got into coaching. And what I learned was I didn't know enough about coaching. I could pole ball, but I was having trouble learning. So I called my old coaches on the phone. And I said, Coach, you know, I, I was fortunate to have some of the best coaches. And I called and said, you know, you're, you're one of the great coaches. You know everything. What should I be doing here? And the coach laughed. And he said, Pat, um, one of the first things you got to know about being a coach is you have to accept the fact you don't know everything. What the <laughs> coaches do is they take material that they gather around around constantly. They're constantly building and growing. And then they insert that into their current training model and build on that. And that's the first thing you need to know. So that was my start in coaching. And so I was a student of the pole vault. It's a very technical event. And so I, I would take all the studies and the training and build it into my what I did as a pole vaulter. I want to do the same in coaching and try and be the best coach I could be. And so we're here tonight to talk about one of the recent things that I've been studying and learning about, it's new to me, but it's not new to the sports world, it's positive coaching alliance. And the, the studies and the science that they have show that it really works. And, I, and I'm guessing that some of you here tonight are here for the same reason, is that you're, you, you're going to walk away with some good points. Right? And that's your intention, is to keep your mind open. So um, we'd like to just go ahead and get into that tonight. And um, so... You heard about me. I'd like to learn a little bit about you. So what I would do at this point is I was going to do the exercise. Yep. You've been coaching for, and I think you might, maybe you mentioned this, if you've been coaching for five years, mm -hmm. everyone stand up. Everyone get up. Mm -hmm. Get everybody. If you've been coaching for five, stay, uh, have a seat. Five or more, stay standing. If you've been coaching for ten, stay standing. Ten or less, have a seat. Twenty, thirty, work to that. And then, um, and then, and then that would be that would get everybody up and moving, right? Yep. Okay, and then say, okay, so we had some you saw some coaches stand up there with twenty or thirty years. So if we have any questions, coaches, can, is it all right if we come on out and ask you here later <laughs> on the presentation? Because I bet you've experienced every scenario that you can in coaching uh, in that many years. Um, so we talked about the Positive Coaching Alliance and working through the slides here. Uh, this will be the Steve Young video. And, and I talked about uh, how I called up one of my old coaches and said, hey, coach, I can tell you that when I came up through sports, I went to my local high school. It's right there in rural Colorado, Ben Road. And um, it was an amazing experience. But it turns out I had a coach who went on to become a national team coach for USA Track and Field. I mean, how lucky is that? A little yeah, small high school that was next to my house. And um, every time I see him, I say to that coach, I say, coach, you changed my life. You made sports. Mm -hmm. Fun, you made it exciting, uh, and you taught that excellence was something that we went after. We didn't settle for uh, just going out there and being average. We wanted to be good. We worked hard at the skills and the techniques and tried to become better. And we all did the best we could. And uh, that's how I remember my coach. So you look at this slide here. It says, "How do you want to be remembered, coach?" So um, I look around the room here. I see we could probably bunch up in groups of five, probably. And then let's take about five minutes and sit down and talk. And if you could just tell amongst yourself, tell a story of one of the best coaches you ever had. And let's spend more time on that. And then if one of you has a story of a chicken bad coach, we'll have to share that. With you. And then we'll break for a little bit. Ready, go. All right. Do that exercise. Do you want to hear my story? I do. I want to hear your story. Um, <laughs> I had a wonderful, one of my best coaches ever was uh, my college coach, my freshman year college field hockey coach. And one of the reasons that she sticks out in my mind is because I was a, a nervous freshman playing Division One, and um, she was actually a new coach that year, which was exciting too. And I thought she was going to run us into the ground because I thought, oh gosh, it's August, it's 95 degrees out here, we're just going to be dead. We're playing on turf, you can see the ripples coming up. And she said, get to practice 10 minutes early. Being on time for practice was 10 minutes early. So I was a wreck. And... Uh, so when we when we got to the field, she there were no there was no field hockey goals. <clears throat> there was no sticks. There were frisbees all over the field, and we played ultimate frisbee for the first 20 minutes, and then like the entire practice was games. We played tag. We played flashlight tag. We did ultimate frisbee. We did you know all these things, and then she stopped practice a half hour early, and we went swimming in the pool, and I was just blown away. I was like, wait a minute, this is Division One field hockey the first day? Like this is crazy. But what I learned is, as the season went on, she really cared a lot about us and that we were having fun in this sport and that it was a sport. It wasn't our life. And she really got to know each of us as a person and she would buy us pizza 
like after a game. I mean, we were in college. We had no money at all. And we'd be, you know, the bus would be coming in after an away game, and she'd tell the bus driver to stop at a pizza place, and she would get pizza for all of us. Like, just things like that that she did that made me really understand that there was a lot more to life than playing the actual sport. But she also got the best out of us, too, on the field, which was pretty cool. Oh, that's a great story. Well, thank you, Kelly, for sharing your story. <laughs> um, and is there anyone else that has a particularly uh, interesting story or powerful story you'd like to share? No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I have a bad story, too. If you want me to be somebody else, I have a bad coaching story, too. Yeah. <laughs> well, those, those are some stories of some good, good stuff. And, and if we ask for bad stories, we could probably get a bunch of those, too. Mm -hmm. We've all had those experiences. Uh, if you've been around sports, you've either seen it or experienced it. Um, that's why Positive Coaching Alliance is out here. Is that the mission is to make a difference in sport. Youth sports is the most powerful arena where life character lessons can be taught and kids, kids can have this great experience. See by the map here, Positive Coaching Alliance is, uh, has a presence all around the United States and it, it continues to grow. We have some great supporters and sponsors to keep it going along. And on this page, you can see some of the top athletes we have. Summer Sanders, Doc Rivers, Julie Cowdy, Bill Jackson. These are all people and uh, some of the top coaches and competitors in the world that support PTA and the mission and the, the information that PTA is getting out. And in the bottom corner there, you'll see a youth coach. And that's what PTA is really about, is youth coaching. You are the primary contact with kids. You're the contact with the organizers in the sport, with the parents. You are the, you are the link that holds it all together in coaches. You have a unique opportunity to make kids' lives amazing that they pass through the brief time that they pass through the world. So the PCA model of coaching is a double goal coach model. PCA is not an organization that says everyone's going to get a career, but that's not what PCA is about. It's competition is great. Having a good competitor is amazing. You've heard the, uh, sometimes we'll throw out the analogy of having a tug of war. If you've got someone good on the other end of the rope, it's a fun tug of war. Competitors are kicking. And so competition is a powerful thing. So we're striving to win, but the double goal coaching, the second goal is teaching life lessons. You've got all these kids that are out having a great time. They love what they're doing. This is a great place to teach. So you can see that they overlap on the next slide. Now the PCA system approach talks about the, the athletes, the coach, the leaders, and the parents. And we do presentations on all of those. And uh, tonight we're talking about the double goal of coaching, which is to win and keep life lessons in So what are the principles that, that PCA has uh, done the research on and found out are really powerful? Well, there's three main ones that we'll be talking about. There's the elm tree of mastery, filling the emotional tank, and honoring the game. Here's a video. All right, so the next slide here, which Olympic athletes earn the most time? You can see from the two questions on there. We call that the scoreboard focus and the mastery focus. And the studies show from the uh, 2000 Olympic Games, Joan Duda. And then, Kelly, I have a, actually have a picture of me standing on the infield at the 2000 Sydney Olympics. Oh, really? Would that be interesting to flash up and say, this is the Olympic Stadium in 2000? That would be totally so, awesome, yes. There. Yeah. Say, but it was from these Olympics, and by the way, my best buddy won the gold medal at that Olympics in the men's solo. That's totally I cool. I remember hearing about this study, but it said, basically, do the athletes that focus only on the result, you know, just the scoreboard, did they do better, or did the athletes who focus on mastering the score? And of course, you know the answer to this one. Yeah. It's, it's the athletes who focus on the, the event and getting better at that. The critique, Pat, has been that that study is too old to use and relevant. Some people have critiqued our workshops and said, you know, any study that's over 10 years old isn't worth it. But in your case, since you were there, totally use it. I think that's awesome. I thought that might be it, especially because it was my best. I have a picture of me wearing his gold medal. That's awesome. There. So like, oh, you know, there it is. Yeah, that's totally okay. great. Cool. All right, so then the Matthew McConaughey video is next. And, um, and my wife Amy said she's gotten feedback that this. People like that McConaughey video, even mm -hmm. though it's on stage in Hollywood, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. It's a matter, I mean, we leave them there. It's up to you. As you said, I'm sure your wife Amy's modified it. You know, you do what works for you. I, I don't love it personally, that video, but I've seen another trainer do it, and it brought me to tears. Like, it was so impactful. So, 
You know, it really it depends on the crowd. Well, I'll, I'll have to learn how to use it. I, I'd love to hear how that other trainer used it well. Yeah. Feedback on that. Anyway, yeah, I'll give you that. So here's the back of the kind of hitting video. And then next slide is the basketball volleyball coach. The hand up in the air. Principle number one, the Elm Tree's mastery. So how do you define the scoreboard and the mastery uh, model of teaching? Well, the scoreboard definition, of course, is all based on results. You look up at the scoreboard, and it's, it, it's all based on comparison with others. And mistakes are not OK. If, you're, if, you're just, if you have to win, then you just can't be making mistakes. Right? The mastery definition talks all about effort, learning, and mistakes. And that's the acronym ELM. Effort, learning, and mistakes are OK. Now, research shows that in the mastery climate, anxiety goes down and self-confidence goes up. And I, I can tell you as an athlete, I've experienced that. And coaching the kids that I work with, I've experienced that as well. <coughs> mastery gives players a feeling of control. They'll work harder and stick to it longer. Now, who wouldn't want that in your athletes? When you're out on the field uh, training and competing with your athletes, I guess it depends on what sport, how you say that. But, um, if you're out on the field with your players, wouldn't it be great if they would all be out there working as hard as they could, sticking to it, great attitude, supporting their teammates, mastery gives those feelings of control. And when it's, when it's in the hands of things you can't control, and when your fate is where it can't be controlled, it's basically, does the other team score a touchdown? You do the best you can, but you can't really control that. That, that uh, reduces that feeling of control. Now the slides I have cut right through, right, right through here. So pretty fast. Okay. <laughs> so I would okay. I would expand on it. I, I, oh no, I'm not skipping over the slides I have here. I'd say that the the uh, the acronym ELM talks about effort, learning, and that mistakes are okay. And all three of those are really important. Now, effort. Your athletes will will do what they're rewarded for. So do you reward them for effort, or do you only reward them if it goes great? Now that's really important distinction because um, in my sport as a football. We have these kids coming out doing a really complicated technical event that happens really fast. And sometimes they'll run down and they'll just do the same habit over and over and over again. So we have a model where we, we reward the kids for doing something. And that's why we just go, whoa, yeah, you did something. We go crazy and they do something. Because it means they're breaking out of the habit. So we're, we are rewarding effort. And we, uh, we, have, we have ways that we just go crazy and get the whole team jumping up and down. We have lots of fun. So, for you, for you to think about as a coach, how might you reward your team for effort? And some examples that other people have given are uh, rewarding kids for, for making an effort to go get a ball, like charging at things. And then this would be a spot where, and I think you did this, Kelly, is where you had them uh, break into small group here and come up with ways to reward effort. Mm -hmm. But perhaps go into learning first, too, and say that, again, kids, kids, um, kids focus on learning. And the way I like to think of it this way, I mentioned that we overlap with these kids for a short period of time. So if you imagine the timeline, they have this long line. We get them to this little bit when they're in our world. My, I, I always feel like my mission is to have them technically, physically, and uh, passionately go through this phase where they, they love the sport more, they're technically better, and they're physically better, and that little brief time that I have them, right? So learning is a big part of that. And if we can focus on having the kids both learn about the history of the sport that we're in, the, the techniques that have to go along with it, and and everything else they can learn about it, as well as off the option skills. And then um, mistakes are okay. This is really big. In some sports, there's coaches that will punish kids terribly for making mistakes. Well, you, you can see where this, this leads. The studies have shown this, that it leads to kids backing off. Like if they're going to they're gonna run in and take a shot and then they get punished for missing the shot, next time that shot comes up, what do you think they're going to do? They're not right? going to take it. Yeah, they're not going to take that shot. So uh, having, having uh, mistakes being okay and rewarding that that concept. So not punishing kids for missing the shot. And then this would be a good thought we could break and say, what are things you can do in practice? Mm -hmm. You know, talk amongst your fellow coaches, and I think it would depend on what the what the group of coaches you had. If they were all the same sport, same age, they could really compare drills and things. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then one of the biggest things is is from the uh, the Elm Toolkit is the mistake ritual, and this was this is one that's been really powerful across the way. But it's when an athlete makes a mistake, what happens immediately after that is really important. 
if they make a mistake and they look over at you as a coach and you go, give them that frowny look, right? Oh, no, that's, even if you tell them later that it was okay that they took that shot, if they see you doing this, so it's really important that, that the way you handle the mistake as a coach is, is, is as important as what they do. What do they do and, and how do you practice this? In, in, in uh, PCA, we call it the mistake ritual. And it's something you can do to brush off a mistake. It's some, some, some that have worked in the past, your coaches will have their athletes brush off their shoulders. There's others that will straighten up their jersey. And it's a signal between you and the coach and between the athlete and the teammates and to themselves, really, that it's okay. They can build on what, uh, that what just happened. They're just doing a fresh start. They're not going to let it hang on. They're going to brush it off and then move on to the game. And so that's the ELM, Elm to the Elm Tree of Mastery. And that's effort, learning, and mistakes are okay. All right. You're good. You have 15 seconds to spare. That's good. Woo! You did it. Nice pace. That was good. That's hard to do in that amount of time, and you did well. You added a lot of stuff in there, too, which is good. I don't feel like you missed anything. Yeah. yeah. No, you did a great job. How did you feel? Did you feel like you were rushing, or did you feel pretty pretty okay? Or? I felt okay. I would, in a presentation, I'd have to shorten it even more because I've done more speaking, and I always go so long. I'm like, that. I'm like, oh, I think of a story. I'll add this, yeah. and I think of something else. And so I actually, yeah, I usually, I keep little cards by me that keep me on tape. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard when you've got so much to share and you have so much to say. Um, it, you know, that's why it's good to get feedback because one of the first times I did it, somebody said, you've been talking for 23 minutes straight. <laughs> the first time I did it, and I was like, really? Oh, my gosh. It didn't feel like it to me because I was just telling stories. But, you know, it's good to have somebody pay attention in, uh, to those things. Um, well, I like yeah. to see pacing, how you, you make people stand up and do stuff. And yeah. Stuff. And I think that's so important. And I'm going to have to remind myself to do that because I, I think I talked for 23 minutes straight. Yeah. And sometimes it's just a matter of raising hands or sticking your hand on your head or stand up or high five somebody next to you or, you know, whatever it is, just to get the audience to kind of reset their brains and, like, okay, here we go. Yeah. So. Well, okay. I'd, I'd love your feedback on that. Yeah. Um, um, as I said, I thought, I thought right off the bat, your presentation style is very um, easy to listen to. You have a very conversational style, and you're smiling when you're presenting, which might seem like a minor thing, but there's so many people that get up there with a straight face and just start spouting out information, and it's not engaging. And so I think just your the way that you present material is very engaging, and your your sentences you, you're quick, but you're not speaking so fast that I can't understand you. So I think that's that's a big plus for you. Um, I loved your story about you know I, my my biggest thing. I love to connect with a presenter that made a mistake or or isn't perfect. And I think that's really a big thing right away because whenever we come in to tell coaches how to coach, the very first thing in their mind is, like, who does this guy think he is? So I think it was really helpful right off the bat when you said, you know, I realized I didn't know how to coach. <laughs> and I went to my coach and he said, well, the first thing you have to realize is you don't know anything. So I think that's, I think that's a great way to start. Um, that right away got me, like, laughing and thinking, oh, yeah, I've been in that boat. I know where you are. So that's a great way to connect to the audience. Um, and I love, I love it when you get everybody up. You know, how many people have been coaching for five years, ten years? The one thing that I would do, though, when you do get those coaches, those final coaches that are standing up that have been coaching for 30-plus years, you know, it, I always, like, give them a round of applause or, or you know, have them say something. You know, tell me about what your coaching experience. And those coaches are so um, proud, I want to say, of how many years they've been coaching. And so it's good for them to be able to get, you know, kind of their chance on a soapbox is, is sort of a little nice thing to do. Um, I'm glad I wanted to share my story too because one of the other things that I think takes a lot of time that you don't necessarily prepare for is hearing answers when you post a question and you want to get two or three people to answer you might have somebody that wants to go off for 10 minutes and tell you the story of their greatest coach or their worst coach and one of the hardest things as a presenter is to say you know how do you cut them off in the middle of the story or how do you kind of reframe them or bring the group back in so I always like to say even in the practice presentations get some people to answer because it takes up more time than you realize to get a few answers in there. Um, the one thing that I, that I did put, I like how you mentioned the mission right away because that's important and you said the mission is to make a difference in sports which is true, which is our mission but I would probably bring it back to PCA's exact mission which is to develop better athletes but more importantly better people um, just for like a tagline, you know, not marketing but you know what I mean, like just to have everybody on the same the verbiage starts getting in their mind, like better athletes, better people, it's catchy, they'll remember it. 
And you know, you can always say our our official mission is to create, to develop better athletes, but more importantly, better people, which is going to make a difference in sports. You know, something like that. But I think that little that little tagline in there is important. Um, I love the tug of war example that you said. I mean, I think it's so true that athletes play up or play down, and tug of war is a great example. I always use that one when you go back to um, a worthy opponent is a gift. You know, and you talk about you can't you can't play tug of war with only one team. So you know, you can always link that back there at the end too. Um, the uh, what else do I have here? Oh, I think one of the things, and I, and I know I went over these each time, but I think it's important when you go over the principles, the three principles of positive coaching, that slide that just has them listed, mm -hmm. rather than just mentioning them, I always like to give people a real quick, like, what's the goal of that? What's the goal of, what's the goal of the elm tree? What's the goal of e-tank? What's the goal of honoring the game? Just so that they know what's coming, because if not, it's just words on a screen, and it doesn't have any meaning to them. So if you had to say like one sentence, if I said, if you said, okay, you know, one of our first principle that we're going to talk about today is called the Elm Tree of Mastery. If I were to ask you, Pat, what would you say is the goal of that entire principle? The Elm Tree of Mastery. Hmm. If you had to put it simply, what are we trying to get coaches to change the way they coach because of what? What are we trying to get them to do? Or what are we trying to get out of the athletes? Yeah, it's, it's obviously trying to get the best performance out of the athletes. Beat up, bottom line. That's it. Stop. Yeah. That's it yeah. right there. Yeah. So that's what I say when, when we, the first principle is the elm tree of mastery. The goal of this principle is to get the best performance out of your athletes. Stop there. Enough said. The second goal is filling the emotional tanks. What would you say is the goal of that? Real short and sweet. Well. They're all to get the best performance out of your athletes is the bottom yeah, yeah. line. But. Well, sorry, I think it's somewhere, it's somewhere in, the, um, in the realm of making sure the kids have a, a great experience that they, mm -hmm. they have fun, but it's also, uh, it also, I mean, they're going to perform better, too. So it's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I always yeah. say for that one, too, you want to get the kids in a state where they're able to hear the most teachable. We want to make them teachable and coachable. So how can we fill their emotional tanks to a point where they are the most teachable and the most coachable to be able to hear all the wonderful things that we have to say as coaches? So that's, that's yeah. sort so of what I say. Do you think get them in the right state? Is that how I, say, I, I say, you know, filling the emotional tanks principle, we're going to talk about getting the kids in the right frame of mind where they're going to be the most coachable and be able to learn the most information. All right. That's what I say for it. That's what I say. You can rephrase it if you want to, but that's what I use. And then honoring the game. What would you say is the goal of honoring the game? Um, well, that's certainly the character piece, right? Mm-hmm. The better people. Yeah, part. definitely the better people part. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. I, I always say to get the kids to realize the game is bigger. There's the bigger picture. Big of picture. you know, bigger picture and, and making the right decisions. I like the better people part. That's good. I always say to get the kids to realize that the game is bigger than themselves and to see the big picture here. Yeah, that's good. To say too. I like that. Bigger picture. Yep, to see the big picture. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's that's my only critique on that slide, rather than just bulleting. You know, give the people a reason to hear it, so. Yeah, and as you said, then you're not just reading the slide, but they're already reading. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They already know what it says. It's written up there. <laughs> um, okay, so, otherwise, I think, um, I, as I said, you definitely have to mention that you went to Sydney. I think that's awesome for credibility, and I think it's so cool that the study that we use in all of our workshops is about the study of the Sydney Olympics, and you were there, so. Definitely put in a picture of yourself. I have a picture of myself and Victor Cruz that I use in my workshops just because I, I think it's cool that I'm there with Victor Cruz, so I put that in. And I, and I didn't jump there as an alternate, so I probably should say that so I don't get to represent. That someone, you what? If, yeah, if someone says later, you jumped in the Olympics, I'd be like, um, I was there as an alternate. <laughs> well, that's okay. You got time, but I was there. <laughs> you weren't the guy that was praying on the sidelines that somebody would break their leg, were you? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. No. <laughs> <laughs> I met someone else that was a, um, she was a, an alternate in track. She ended up going for track um, as an alternate to the last Olympics. And she said, you know, it's a sad thing when you're at the Olympics, kind of wishing somebody would get hurt. <laughs> it's not quite the right way to do it. Right way to do it. Oh, uh, yeah. I also think, too, when you tell a story, your energy level rises. Um, then when you're just telling information, you become very animated when you tell a story, which is cool. It's not the same exact, 
you know, phrasing that you used all the time. So I thought that was good. I noticed when you told a couple stories, like even when you were trying to get your athletes to do something different, you were like, ah, you know, that woke me up. That got me engaged. So you're, you're a good storyteller. You, you bring energy into your stories, which is, which is good. And I think that's, that's a perfect example. Your stories were quick, but I get the point. Like you got a kid that's doing the same thing over and over again, and he finally does something different, and the coaching staff is like, yeah, you know, that's effort. I don't care what you did. You just did it different than you did before. So I thought that was great. Um, I also like the timeline. I think that's powerful for people to realize that they only have a short amount of time with the athletes. And I love the way you said, you know, technically, physically, passionately. Those are buzzwords that I'll remember. And if you can take that little short amount of time that you have with them and make it the best you can, you know, that is such a huge impact. You have a lot of power. That's one of the things when we talk about the most influential coach you've ever had. That's what we want coaches to realize, that you have so much influence and so much power in a short amount of time, <laughs> in a little yeah. basic. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, even your example of, you know, when you're, when you're going through the Elm Tree, E-L-M, when you said about mistakes, you know, you gave a really quick, easy example. You take a shot, you miss it. The coach yells at you and you're punished for your mistake. You're not going to take the shot. I've heard people take that quick of a story and make it into a 10-minute dissertation about one time they had a coach and they went and they took a shot and the coach said, you know, took him out of the game and you were just, you were quick, you were sweet to the point, I get it, and you moved on, which was, which was really good. Um, the only comment I have at the end, when you were talking about the mistake ritual, um, the one thing that actually I mentioned in the beginning, and this is something that Ruben actually pointed out when he was on a call with me earlier in the week that I didn't, I never even caught when people do it, PCA has actually done no studies which I thought was a real, somebody said, oh, PCA has done a study to find out that this and this and no. this is true. We have not done any studies ourselves. We have borrowed and used studies that are by much more intelligent people than we are. <laughs> um, okay. We've used the studies from, you know, sports psychologists and athletes and researchers and, and all of these different people from Harvard and Yale and Stanford and all these places, but PCA itself is not a research company. So one of the things you said, like, PCA did research on the mistake ritual. I forget how you mentioned it, but I was like, oh, let me mention that to you a bit. Something to point out. Um, but the other thing about the mistake ritual, and there are studies to back this up, the point of the mistake ritual is that it's a physical sign for a mental reset. And I always put those two things together because something that's a physical, and it's actually been psychologically shown that if kids see something physical like a flush or brush it off or let it go or something like that, it can trigger in their mind a mental reset to move on to the next play. So yeah. I just wanted to point that out, that I yeah, thought that was good. a good... I, I, I could feel that I was... I, I, as I started to explain it, I'm like, I don't know how to say this. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. you know, like it's just a thing. <laughs> yeah, so that's a, that's a great way. Physical sign for mental reset. I like that. Yeah. So, and that's... And that's that, there are studies to back that up that we have not done. <laughs> so, okay. but that's... I think, I mean, for the most part, I think you did a great job. You kept right on pace. You kept me engaged. Your stories were great. And... Uh, I thought it was excellent. Great, and then tomorrow, same thing, right? Tomorrow, uh, Thursday, right? Is it Thursday? Thursday. Yeah, right. yeah. Thursday at two. I think I have Thursday yeah. at two. Yes, and and you're going to be the two Pats are going to be going. Patrick Peliquin and you are going to be going. And, and it's an uh, hour. I'm sorry. It takes one hour. It's well, I figure you're going to go for like you go for 20 minutes, and then we do feedback, and then he's going to go for 20 minutes. So. I mean, it'll be a little less than an hour, but I think Ruben's going to be on with me, too, and he tends to, to critique a lot. So um, it, with both of us, I think it'll be about an hour. And then if, if my presentation tomorrow is, is 15 minutes like it was today, is that okay, or do I need to... Yeah. Take no, that's, that's great. I think 15 minutes, 15 minutes is a good chunk of time. As I said, sometimes Elm Tree goes longer, but um, in the real presentation, you would have less for an introduction because we were to introduce you, so... I think right. I think you did. I mean, you you got in everything in 15 minutes with 14 seconds to spare. So I thought that was good. That well, was I, really just, good. Yeah, I want to make sure I don't have to slow it down tomorrow and try to make it last 20 minutes because that'll, that'll change. No, my no, no. Don't worry yeah. about it because you'll also have more audience members too. So when you pose a question, you'll have more than just me answering. You know, it's good to get a couple voices in the room. So that'll take up some more time too. <clears throat> okay. All okay. right. Well, thanks, Pat. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll send so, you the link again, like I did. Perfect. I'll, I'll wait for that. Thanks. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.